Al White here. Have you ever tried to make your 3D renders look like a painting? I feel like this is something that a lot of 3D artists have tried to accomplish, and it is quite a journey. So today I'm going to share with you the joy of trying to achieve a painterly filter in Blender with just six node groups. It's been a fun-filled journey of endless frustration and just a bit of disappointment. But as you can see from these renders, it was all totally worth it. This is a little complicated, so I think it's probably best to go ahead and watch the entire video first and then come back and pause on the node layouts if you want to try it yourself, while also pulling out your hair in frustration. So let's go back to the dark ages of 2019. Happy New Year! <laughs> oh, wow! Now what the hell's an NFT? New numbers showing COVID cases on the right. Mandatory evacuations are on the way with... I was trying to capture that beautiful painterly effect from The Dam Keeper by Tonko House. Everyone kept telling me to just do it in the compositor. Mainly didn't because I wanted the effects to be live in the viewport. I decided to make my own compositor in the shader editor to view in the scene, but how? I'm not a coder, so I had to find a way to mirror all of the objects in the scene all at once and then alter them in some type of way, almost like a camera filter. One thing I definitely did not want was to have to do it on each individual object in the scene, like previous attempts. That's when I came across this article about creating a fake zoom lens in front of your camera and zooming in without moving it. It was from before the dinosaurs with Blender 2.7. This was before Eevee even existed. It was using the refraction shader, a pretty underused node in the shader editor. I parented a plane to the camera, made a lot of adjustments and tweaks to the refraction shader, and boom, my first camera filter was born. Then I just altered the normals of the refraction shader with the texture, and voila, a painterly effect, or at least the start of one. Fast forward two years, and I was working on my illustration shader. I was using the new geometry nodes to instance paint strokes across an object and transfer the normal of that object to the strokes. This was used to capture the lighting in the scene. It worked okay, but the only problem was that the strokes were just randomly placed and needed to flow with the mesh. The whole painting looked like a drunken monkey had just thrown up on a canvas, and I was not happy with that. I did find that if I drew curves onto the scene, I could make the strokes kind of follow them somewhat, but it wasn't automated, and would have needed constant tweaking for each frame of an animation. Another year later, I finally started to understand the mysteries of geometry nodes, thanks to some of the best node artists out there. I asked Arendell, Doppelganger, and Nugget if there was a way to transfer or replicate the Grease Pencil Line Art modifier into geometry nodes as curves, to basically use them as the curves that would control the stroke direction. And guess what? There actually was. With all these pieces in place, I could finally create the Blender Live Paint Filter. It's not easy, and it requires six super complicated node groups, and a lot of tweaking, but it's worth it, trust me. The satisfaction of finally achieving the painterly effect is unparalleled, or at least that's what I keep telling myself. So what exactly did Aaron, Doppel, and Nugget show me? Occlusion calling. This delightful feature deletes all the faces of an object that the camera can't see. How does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. It just shoots rays from each point of your mesh towards the camera. If it hits, it's in the camera view. If it doesn't hit, it's not. So basically, we were able to determine which part of the objects were visible and which weren't, and then extracted the edge that were part of both of those selections. And what did we get from all this artwork? Well, just a mediocre start to a line art modifier. It's not perfect, but hey, it's a start. And let me tell you, this line art trick has been a lifesaver for me. With my illustration shader, I used it to distribute strokes along the silhouette of the object to make it more unique and break up the space. But for this project, I'm using it to create a flow map for each of the brush strokes. As you can see here, I'm using a collection input to be the base of the line art. That collection is the entire scene. So the objects that you have in your scene that you want line art to be coming from, you need to be inputting that into that collection. Next up was distributing instrument strokes across the model. Didn't take too long with geometry nodes, obviously, but I immediately found that I wasn't a huge fan of this. The main reason was that depending on where the stroke was compared to the camera, each object would have to have a different scale of strokes in the scene. I was also not a fan of how I would need to have geometry nodes and special shaders on each individual object. <sighs> yeah. So I decided to tackle this in a different way, and this ended up being one of the best decisions that I made. I ended up instead bringing back the camera filter plane and pinning all of the line art and strokes of the scene to that plane. Well, let's face it, who has the time to manually create that plane and parent it to the camera? No one. So that's why I, like any self-respecting artist, decided to tackle the problem in geometry notes again. Sounds easy, right? Wrong. 
because apparently the camera must have some kind of opinion on the matter too, with its fancy settings for resolution and field of view. Behold, the completed canvas that stretches to fit your camera's resolution and can even change size depending on that pesky field of view. Just don't try to use it in orthographic view. Next up was the fun part, parenting. This is where things get interesting because we must constantly keep that plane in front of the camera, no matter how much it moves or turns. And the best way to do that is with just a bunch of vector math, which is basically just a fancy way of saying confusing equations that you have to follow perfectly or everything will fall apart. Yep, but don't worry, I won't bore you with the details. The only part that I really need you to set is the draw plane offset in the middle, which basically just controls how close or far away the painting is from your camera. Oh, and this group also does the camera alignment for your strokes. This will make it to where your strokes are always facing towards the camera perfectly. Definitely important for this filter. It was time to finally create the strokes, which shouldn't be too difficult. It's just a basic grid again. But for the shader of this filter, I used a square brush stroke. So I had to make sure that the grids squashed or stretched to fit the desired final shape of the strokes. I also set up the stroke UVs using some basic vector math in the materials for this stroke. Make sure to store that so we can use it later in the shader editor. Okay, now it was time to start bringing everything together and create the painting. This group combined the data and the mesh from the previous groups, taking our plane and distributed the strokes along it. It also uses the line art to generate the rotation and the scale of each stroke, making the flow much, much better. This group also controls the density and offset of the painting, making strokes away from the line art larger and less dense to retain detail while keeping the overall shape abstract and simplified. All in all, it was a pretty standard process, just like creating a painting while simultaneously tearing out my hair and questioning my sanity. And finally, it's time to get our brush strokes looking super close up and magnifying with the magic of zoom. Don't worry, this is actually the easiest of all the groups. All we must do is take the position of each stroke and subtract the camera location from it. This handy trick gives us the normal direction for each of the refraction shaders which we can then send over to the shader editor just like we did our UVs, now we have stored the normal direction as an attribute. Just like that. Okay, so now we are done with the geometry nodes. Here's the full tree. I have a high res image of the tree in the description that you can download just to see it more precisely. Okay, before we head over to the shader editor, first, we need to make some adjustments in our render properties. It's crucial to use E for this shader because without it, we'll run into issues with objects refracting through each other. Another important step is to enable the screen space reflection and changing the trace precision to one and edge fading to zero. These small changes will make all the difference in your experience. Oh, and lastly, go down to film and turn up overscan to 10. Now I know that it's maxed at 10, but sometimes you might have to put it to like 15 or 20%. Just type it in and it will work fine. If you are getting weird black strokes on the borders of your render, that is what will probably fix it. Now, head into the shader, first things first, you need to change your material blend mode from alpha blend to alpha hashed. This is because Eevee does not like multiple transparent objects in front of each other. So, if you are ever using any transparent object in your scene, it will require alpha hashed. Okay now, in the shader editor, all you must do is use the attribute node to import your stroke normal into the refraction shader and crank up the IOR to a number of likes that you hope that I get on this video. Anything over 100 will work. This will essentially turn each stroke into a zoom lens and simplify the scene while keeping all the colors and the values. And if you want to take it to the next level, you can bump up the roughness to about 0.025. This will make things a little bit more simplified. Next, use a brush stroke alpha mask like this one to make all of your planes look like actual brush strokes. Just make sure that you're using the UV map attribute we made earlier. Don't use the normal texture coordinate node and that it is rotated correctly because nobody wants some wonky stretch painting strokes. Now, if you're feeling extra ambitious, you can even do a grid vector node like this to randomly select from 36 different images from a single texture or even combine your mask, bump, and ambient inclusion map all into one image. Not necessary, but it does help with the optimization. Here's the tree for the grid vector node as well if you're interested. Not necessary, but it's cool. Well, congratulations, you just learned how to add a painterly filter to Blender. But if you're still struggling to understand, don't worry. Just rewatch the video a few more times and maybe pause on all the node layouts. You'll get it, trust me. Or if you really want to impress your friends, you can check out the advanced version of this filter that is available on my Gumroad. It's jam-packed with extra options including hue and value variation, minimax scale control, detail level, 
base color and normal baking, and even a new shadow support that makes it easy for your strokes to follow the shadows. I have another video right here that shows you how you can use that advanced version and add it to your own scenes. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed learning about this ridiculous journey. If you liked the video, don't forget to leave a comment, give it a like, and maybe even consider subscribing to my channel. I appreciate your support so much and cannot wait to bring you more content in the future.